Hello, how are you doing? I hope you're okay and staying well. Um, it's just gone nine o'clock here in Port Stewart, Northern Ireland, where like uh, most people in the world, I'm staying at home. And uh, every night at this time, I'm reading uh, another chapter from uh, my books. And uh, tonight I'm on to chapter 14 of Paperboy. So uh, thanks for uh, joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoy this kind of Belfast bedtime story. As uh, I hope it brings you a bit of nostalgia, a bit of crack that kind of eases you through part of these long, extraordinary days that we're living through. So anyway, chapter 14 of Paperboy is entitled, Save the Children. I was shocked, so I was. I was really shocked. No one had ever told me. I was standing in the telephone box with my paper bag half full in a vain attempt to shelter from the merciless hailstones that were suddenly raining from the sky. They had already penetrated my Harrington jacket and made the tartan run, so that the red dye had come off on my Bay City Rollers t-shirt and all over Les McCune's face. I gave the impression that Les was wearing lipstick like the lead singer from Sweet. Though at least the ash from Titch McCracken's cremated newspapers was by now almost completely eradicated from the stone floor beneath me. I opened the pages of that night's belly telly to pass the time until the worst of the heel was over and I could resume my professional responsibilities. The hailstones were, however, still spitting at me ferociously through a few broken window panes that had suffered the consequences of Philip Ferris's catapult practice. So I began to read a report in the newspaper about starving babies in Biafra. All at once, I came across words I had never seen or heard before. They said that there was enough food in the world to feed everyone. I was shocked. If there was enough food to go around everyone in the whole world, then why were the Biafran babies still starving? I couldn't quite grasp it. It wasn't fair. The report said there was enough food to feed us all, but that rich countries didn't share it properly with poor countries. I couldn't believe it. Why not? I was certain that if anyone in Belfast heard that we babies were starving to death anywhere in our city, we would share our smash and fish fingers with them right away, even if they kicked with the wrong foot. At BRA, if someone forgot their dinner money or their lunchbox, everyone would help out with a few crisps and a Derry Lee triangle. In our street, if my mother ran out of sugar, she was always able to borrow some from Auntie Emma, and if any of the other paper boys was ever a telly short, one of us would always donate him a spare one. Maybe it was because Africa was too far away to share with. Maybe planes didn't go to Africa, but I was sure I remembered Princess Anne going to Africa on a plane to go on safari with Blue Peter. I really couldn't understand what the problem could possibly be. America was even further away than Africa in my geography atlas and people got on planes all the time to go over there and give their money to Disneyland. So why could we not bring enough money or even enough food on a plane to stop the Biafran babies from starving to death? It wasn't fair, I thought, and it didn't make sense. Something had to be done about this. This injustice required action. As soon as the hailstones stopped, I emerged determinedly from the telephone box, like Superman with a paper bag, resolving that I, for one, would share my riches with Africa. I knew I was just a wee lad from up the shankle, but I wanted to follow in the footsteps of Cliff Richard and Mother Teresa, even though he was old-fashioned and she was a Catholic. I was going to help the poorest people in the world. So where did I go first to look for an opportunity to save humanity? The back pages of Lucan, of course. By this stage, I had already answered most of the ads that appeared there every week, including one for the ABBA fan club and one for a silver pen with a personalised rubber stamp with your name on, hidden in a secret compartment inside. 
When I read in the ABBA fan club newsletter how much Bjorn said he adored Agnetha, I eventually stamped my name. It was only a few weeks after I had resolved to help the babies in Africa that I saw a fresh notice squeezed in between the ads selling sea monkeys that died and those relating to my former hero, Charles Atlas. This was an advertisement from the Save the Children Fund, asking me to join their roundabout club to raise money for the poor wee children. I responded earnestly and in a 50p postal order. A few weeks later, I received my very own fundraising pack. My roundabout club folder included a letter signed by a real sir in England who was the boss of saving the children. No one in our house had ever received a letter from a sir before, so I had to show it off to everyone. My, big, my wee brother wanted to know if the sir was related to Sir Lancelot in the King Arthur cartoons. And my granny was most impressed. I always thought you were the swankiest wee grandson, love, she said tearfully. My father was less enthusiastic. No son of mine will ever be tugging his forelock to no English sir, he proclaimed. I hadn't a clue what he was talking about. The Roundabout Club pack also included a badge, stickers and a membership book where you earned points for all the money you sent to save the children. The more points you would get, you could win a bronze, a silver and a gold badge like in the Olympics. I quickly got the hang of it and every few months I sent a 50p postal order from my surplus tips. It wasn't long before I earned a bronze badge. However, every time I received a Roundabout Club newsletter, I noticed there were lots of photos of very clean children in England getting their picture taken with the Sir and being presented with their gold badges because they had raised 50 pounds doing sponsored pony rides. I could never have dreamed of raising that much money because we didn't have ponies in Belfast. Although you could have a ride on a wooden horse on Mickey Marley's roundabout in Cord Market on a Saturday afternoon for only 10p. I decided, however, that I would come up with an exciting plan for a major fundraising event which might at least earn me a silver badge. It might even result in me getting my picture taken with the real sir and possibly save lots of more children in the process. As I delivered my papers each night in the shadows, I mulled over various ideas. Even though I knew that too much thinking while delivering the papers could be hazardous, there was always the danger of standing in Petra's poop or not spotting a wee hood lurking in an entry. I was already an experienced fundraiser. In fact, during the annual Bob a Job Week for the Scouts, I would wash cars and pull out weeds from Nasturtian borders for a whole six days. Not on the Sunday, of course, because that would have been a sin. I also raised a pound every year by collecting 100 pennies from all my aunties and putting 100 pinpricks in a Presbyterian Orphan Society card. As I contemplated all my fundraising options, I considered a sponsored Opportunity Knox, like on TV, with me as a young Huey Green. But then I knew nobody would enter except Ari Maxwell singing David Cassidy out of tune. I also came up with the idea of a sponsored football keepy uppy competition, but then I knew my big brother would only win and everyone would say it was fixed. I even thought about ringing Gloria Honeyford at UTV to ask her to do a bingo session in the church hall, but I knew it wouldn't be allowed. Bingo was bad because it was gambling. Eventually, after a careful evaluation of all the possibilities, I settled on a marvellous plan for my first fundraising project for the babies in Africa. It would be the best fundraiser our street had ever seen. A jumble sale. Not just any ordinary jumble sale, however, but a wonderful innovation which would feature musical speakers and hot dogs. Not only would I be selling high quality second-hand merchandise, 
I would also be offering musical treats and tasty refreshments. This was taking the concept of the humble jumble sale to a whole new level. I would give all those wee girls and their ponies in England a good run for their money. So I'll continue the story in a wee second. Just want to say hello uh, to a few people. Uh, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, Susan, it's lovely to have you along as usual. And Andrea, great to have you. Hi, uh, Marty and Ali and Kenneth and Bevan. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it, Andrea and Marty. Um, yes, uh, thank you. We're all doing well here and I'm glad you're enjoying the readings. Hello, Damien in Edinburgh. Hope you're doing okay there. Um, Jim, Poole, good evening to you as well. Hi, Ali Bennett. Hello to Ali and also Lucy and Zoe, who both now have purple hair. That sounds, that sounds like a good way to use this time. I have no hair, but if I did, I, I, I would be tempted. Uh, hello, Alan McCready, who's the son of the uh, very famous uh, bread man who features in the next book. Hello, Alison and Betty. Hi, Francis McGrath and Anne Brown and uh, uh, Dee Smith and the lovely Leslie from up the country, who's up the stairs at the minute. Hello, Michael McKinley Sr. And Neve, nice to have you along. Hi, Ruth. And uh, I'm glad you're all enjoying it. I'm going to continue the story of uh, my first attempt at fundraising uh, uh, in the chapter of Paperboy called Save the Children. So this is about my jumble sale. My harmonious sale, complete with culinary delights, would take a lot of serious planning and preparation. First of all, I had to climb up into the darkness of the roof space in order to select appropriate stock from boxes of old stuff. I loved it up there in the attic. It felt safe and was packed with faded boxes full of old black and white photographs of my father with hair and my mother and her wee sister, Auntie Doris, looking all young and glamorous like film stars in old movies on Saturday afternoons on the TV. As I rummaged through my family's relics from the 1950s and 1960s, I felt as if I had travelled back in time in the TARDIS. I discovered ancient 78s by Jim Reeves and dusty hardback books about birds and fish and flowers. I found old granny china ornaments of hedgehogs and uh, fox terriers wrapped up in ancient Belfast telegraph pages, delivered no doubt by some long grown up paper boy. To my delight, I uncovered a real treasure in the form of an old Doctor Who annual from years ago when the Doctor was an old man with white hair and he didn't even have a scarf. From all of this, I retrieved the most saleable items and priced them sensibly. Next, I would set out my wares on the kitchen table at our front gate to attract passing customers, all the while imagining that I was a window dresser for the Christmas display in Anderson and Macaulay's on Royal Avenue. To add to the whole attraction, my master stroke would be to borrow the speakers from the Westy Disco, plug them into our stereogram and blast out the hit parade through the sitting room windows and into the street. The upper shankle had never seen a jumble sale like this before. You would be able to buy a slightly tipped ornament, an Elvis 78, and an old book about flowers while singing along to Mamma Mia. If you didn't like ABBA, you could pay 5p to request a different song. It would be a bit like a jukebox, except I would have to run into the sitting room to change the record on the stereogram. The biggest innovation of all, however, would be the ingenious addition of hot dogs to the traditional jumble sale format. No one on our street had ever attempted this before. I calculated that if I bought a dozen sausages and a normal pan loaf and borrowed the tomato ketchup from my Auntie Hetty and sold 12 hot dogs at 20p each, then I could more than double my money and get my silver badge. I, I mean, save lots of children. On the day itself, however, it was the hot dogs that turned out to be the biggest practical challenge. I found myself having to grill the sausages in the kitchen while at the same time serving customers at the kitchen table at the gate in between running in and out of the sitting room to change the records on the stereogram. 
This proved to be much more demanding than even delivering 48 Belfast telegraphs in the rain. I had realised prior to the big day that I would require additional manpower for my enterprise and accordingly had initiated a staff recruitment process with my family. It seemed that my parents would not be available. My father would be doing overtime at the foundry for a new hall and stairs carpet and my mother had a silk kimono dress to finish on the sewing machine for a swanky woman up the Malone Road for some big dinner dance she was going to at the Chimney Corner Hotel. My big brother declined my offer of gainful employment with the words, Why's that bop, wee lad? Though he kindly donated a pair of old red clackers for the jumble sale. Clackers were basically two snooker balls on two strings that you banged together up and down very fast until they made a loud clacking noise and bruised your wrists. They had been the latest thing, but they'd gone out of fashion very quickly, like hula hoops and the peace people. Thankfully, my wee brother had been an enthusiastic recruit to my team. I quickly delegated to him some of the duties of running in and out of the house, which he happily did at great speed on his bright orange space hopper. Of course, he was too young to go near the sausages grilling in the oven in the kitchen, but he was good at fetching knives. He knew how to change records on the stereogram, although as it turned out, he did put on Two Little Boys by Ralph Harris far too many times. I had to cook the sausages myself. I decided to grill instead of fry because in my experience the grill was less likely to go on fire than the frying pan. I knew you were supposed to fry most foods but I decided to make an exception for the hot dog sausages on this occasion because I would need to be able to cook them while at the same time selling goods and taking musical requests. I had purchased two packets of Cookstown sausages because Geordie Best ate them on commercials on UTV. Geordie Best was only the it was Geordie Best was the only real superstar from Belfast and the only one with a Northern Ireland accent on TV who didn't talk about fighting. He was the best footballer on earth and he liked parties and Miss Worlds. I wasn't very good at football and my big brother said I couldn't kick back doors, but Jordy was still a hero to me. So I figured that if my hot dogs had Jordy Best sausages in them, they would sell like hotcakes. On the day of the great jumble sale, my first customer was Alnister Butler, who was bad with his nerves. He bought an ancient Elvis 78 called Heartbreak Hotel. It didn't seem to me like it would cheer him up very much, but he seemed very satisfied anyway. Mr. Butler then ordered a hot dog with red sauce. When I put the sausage into this first hot dog, it had looked a little too pink, but even though it wasn't fully cooked, I served it up anyway because I wanted all of my potential customers to hear that I served fast food like that McDonald's in America. I smothered the sausage with extra ketchup so that Mr. Butler wouldn't notice the pink meat. He seemed to thoroughly enjoy it. My next customer was Titch McCracken. When he arrived at the kitchen table, sitting out in the street, Titch's eyes immediately fixed on the red clackers. Much for the clackers, he inquired brusquely. Fifty noobs, I replied with an air of assurance. Titch opened his plastic wallet. It was the same wallet he always had with him on bus trips and at the tuck shop at the Westy Disco. There were never any pound notes in it, but it always contained a small picture of Olivia Newton-John and a wee square wrapper that said Durex on it. I could understand why you would want to have Olivia in your wallet, but I couldn't fathom why you would keep the same wee square wrapper in your wallet for years and years and never take it out. Of course, on this occasion too, the wallet was bereft of cash. Ever since being sacked by Al Mac over the incendiary incident in the phone box, we tits had struggled to make ends meet, and he had been barred from the local mace for stealing sweetie mice. Wysik, 
was his response to my perfectly reasonable price for a pair of clackers. But before this business negotiation could get into full swing, I heard my wee brother shouting from the kitchen, Quick, quick, the sausages is all on fire! He cried alarmingly. I rushed indoors to the kitchen, and sure enough, the sausage fat in the grill had ignited. There was smoke everywhere. It looked like the stage on top of the pops. I feared my jumble sale would turn into a smoke damage sale, like in the co-op superstore. I had learned in chemistry class and on Blue Peter not to throw water over a fire in the kitchen, so I bravely lifted the whole grill pan by its hot handle and threw it out the back door into the garden. Sausages rained down on the clover-ridden lawn. For a moment I wondered if this was what it was like to throw a petrol bomb, except a bomb wouldn't have the sausages, of course. The grill pan landed hard, crashing my crushing my father's favourite rose bush, so I knew I was in trouble. But at least I hadn't set the house on fire. It was the lesser of two evils. Acting quickly, I retrieved the least burnt sausages from the ground. I inserted the most heavily carbonised pork through the wire into Snowball's hutch. Interestingly, although Snowball was a particularly obese albino rabbit, he remained steadfastly vegetarian, even when exposed to such high levels of temptation. I then washed the surviving sausages in the sink to clean the soil and grass and left them on the draining board to dry. Once the emergency was over, I returned to my neglected customers in the street. By the time I returned to my sales station at the table, however, both Titch McCracken and the Red Clackers had mysteriously vanished. Later, he steadfastly denied that he had stolen these objects of desire, but the sudden appearance of bruises on his wrists the next day gave him away. As natural justice would have it, a few weeks later, Titch ended up in the Royal with a broken wrist. I was sure it had been the clackers. By this stage, the marvellous jumble sale was deteriorating into chaos. I had sold very little, lost merchandise to my shoplifting mate, and burned my Geordie best sausages. However, just as I was about to admit defeat and close up shop, a crowd of girls came walking down the street. Linking arms happily, they were chewing gum and singing, We are the Millie girls, we wear our hair and curls, we wear our skinners to our knees. We neither smoke nor drink, that's what our parents think, we are the Shankle Millie girls. I immediately recognised the gift of a marketing opportunity. I dashed indoors, put Donny Osmond on the stereogram and turned the speakers up full blast. It worked. The girls were enthralled. They stopped at my table in the street with eyes wide open. They had never heard Donny in the street before. Have you any rollers, wee lad? They inquired in unison. All their albums? I replied triumphantly. Class, said the leader of the gang as she twirled a long stretch of chewing gum around her forefinger. Within seconds, I had made 50 pence from Bay City Rollers' requests alone. The girls weren't really too interested in the jumble sale, but they enjoyed the music and I was sure they would go for the hot dogs. I'm going to see the rollers at the Ulster Hall, so I am, I said, knowing this would enhance the prospect of further sales. Class, said the leader of the gang as she scraped the chewing gum from her forefinger into her mouth with her two front teeth. Um, are you going to be on the Westy Disco float in the Lord Mayor's show? She asked. Yeah, my ma and da are organising it, I replied proudly. By this stage of the conversation with the Millie girls, I was feeling quite the lad. Until that is, the next question hit me right between the eyes. Are you seeing Sharon Burgess? Asked one of the smaller girls I'd never met before. I. I replied, blushing. She's only going out with you because she fancies your big brother, you know, my interlocutor announced with great authority. In that instance, everything stopped. This was front page headline news. 
For a second, my whole world stopped turning. The record player turntable and the stereogram in the sitting room was still going obstinately round. However, I could only vaguely hear the words of Bye Bye Baby in the background. I pretended to ignore the wee Millie girl's comment. I said nothing in reply, but I would relive and remember those words for hours and days afterwards. This was worse than having a bad heart. It was having a broken heart. However, for the present, I had to put my acting skills into practice. Miss Barron would have been very proud of me. I simply pretended nothing had happened and I offered the gang of girls a hot dog with a Geordie Best sausage. They were delighted and I took an order for four hot dogs. Fortunately, that corresponded exactly with the number of surviving sausages now drawn out on the draining board in the kitchen. I had now learned my lesson in terms of leaving uh, the store securely compromised. So this time I sent my wee brother inside with instructions to carry out the sausages and the bread on our full brass pattern tray. He eagerly obeyed and within 10 seconds he re-emerged from the house bounding up the pathway, clinging onto one ear of his bright orange space hopper with one hand and carrying the tray of Geordie Best sausages and an Ormo pan loaf with the other. Unfortunately, my wee brother's enthusiasm had resulted in an unnecessary level of acceleration and as he sped closer and closer to the jumble sale table, I realised that another disaster was about to unfold. With the sound of a drum solo from Derek playing in the background, my wee brother crashed into the table, tipping the four mica and launching the entire contents of the jumble sale into the road like an Apollo liftoff. To make matters worse, he then lost his balance completely on impact with the table and the tray carrying the hot dogs continued on its trajectory into the middle of the road. Our street was strewn with smashed glass, books, broken records, bread and sausages. It looked like North Street after a bomb in Woolworths. My wee brother had landed right on top of me, knocking me over so that I ended up horizontal on the pavement on top of half a normal pan loaf and a bottle of tomato ketchup. The sauce splattered all over the back of my Harrington jacket. I couldn't believe it. I'd only just got rid of the smell of book from the large Drenar Ferry from my most favourite article of clothing. And now I'd have to splash on even more brute all over to mask the smell of tomato sauce. But sure, it didn't matter what I smelt like anymore. I suddenly thought Sharon Burgess was going to two-time me with my big brother. And he would just love that while I would be chucked and humiliated. Meanwhile, the gang of Millie girls ran away up the street, giggling guiltily as if they were afraid of being blamed for something. Then, I'm afraid, my pacifist principles were once again compromised. I kicked my wee brother hard on the shins until he stopped laughing and started crying. I looked around at the devastation before me. It wasn't fair. I looked across at the bright orange space hopper, now lying still in the middle of the road. Its big, smiley face seemed to be looking straight at me. Petra, the dog, was standing beside it, wagging her tail, happily eating up all the remaining Geordie Best sausages. I had tried my best, but on my first amazing fundraising venture, I had just ended up losing money. I would never get my silver badge or get my picture taken with a real English sir and no children whatsoever would be saved. The space hopper smiled a huge mocking smile at me. It wasn't fair. Life wasn't fair. So it wasn't. The world wasn't fair. So there you are. That is chapter 14. Paper boy. Let's say hello to a few people. We just want to thank you all for listening. Um, hello, Andy McCauley, another one of the clan McCauley from around the world tuning in. Hello, Maria, lovely Maria Garvey, lovely to have you here. Hi, Hazel Francie. Hello, Angela and Keith, great to have you here again. Hello, and Heather Carey and uh, Julie Timlin. Hello, Anne Kirk. Hi, Stuart Dixon, glad you could join. And Clark Whitaker. Hi, Davy Dunwoody, hope you're all uh, staying safe and well there. Hi, Brendan Toll. 
Uh, hi, Tony. Uh, every chapter, a great story and memories of Belfast in the 70s. Had my own little paper around in the 60s on Dunkern Gardens. All right, I know it well. On both sides, um, obviously not possible in the 70s, as you say. That's brilliant, Brendan. Hello, uh, Alain and Alan McCready. Glad you enjoyed it as well. So thanks for joining me uh, this evening. And uh, I'll be back same time tomorrow for the next chapter of Paperboy. Until then, stay home, stay well, and stay positive. Bye for now.